Um, welcome to the Korea Society. Um, tonight, we will meet two authors who both reimagined the classic novels. First, I would like to introduce our moderator, Peter Bungnim Choi. If I got that right. He was born and raised in South Korea and completed his undergraduate studies at Yonsei University in Seoul. And he just told me that he came to the US when he was 29 <laughs> um, and um, got a master's degree in communication from the City University in New York. He has worked as a reporter and writer in the US and Korea for more than 20 years. He has published two books of poetry and two novels in Korean. His recent book, The Mountain Rats, is his short story collection in English. He lives in Port Washington, New York, with his wife and has three daughters. So welcome. <coughs> yeah, actually, I'm curious, before we get started, how many of you have read at least one of the two books tonight? OK, not many. Yeah. <laughs> OK, OK, great, go ahead. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for your coming here tonight. And also, I thank the Korea Society for giving us um, this wonderful praise for the book talk. This is a very special praise. My name is Peter Choi. I'm tonight's moderator. My job today is uh, to introduce two beautiful baby girls. <laughs> <laughs> this baby's name is uh, Jane, <laughs> and uh, this baby's name is Alice. <laughs> and she is this baby's mother, <laughs> and uh, she is uh, Jane's mother. <laughs> no father, only mother, <laughs> because uh, produce a the beautiful book. I don't think uh, they need mother, uh, <laughs> father, only the. <laughs> and uh, um, I know the Adrian Leslie for many years. She thinks she's Korean, <laughs> and uh, I would call her a American Korean, and uh, Patricia a Korean American, <laughs> because she, the Adrian, taught Korean students at the school for many years, and she has uh, many Korean friends, too many, I call, <laughs> and more than I do. <laughs> And uh, she is a member of the Korean American Scholarship Foundation. I think some of the, um, our the Scholarship Foundation people are here. And uh, I'm a member too. She visited Korea by the invitation of the Korea, Korean government many summers ago. She spent the whole summer there. And Alice again is the story about the uh, American woman and the Korean man. And uh, I read this book about seven months ago, uh, several months ago. And uh, she and I had a joint book reading last September in Queens. And uh, at that time, um, I created a short story in English, the title, The Mountain Rats. This is the first time I met uh, Patricia, and I know her father. Where is it? The <laughs> Peter father? <laughs> yeah. I have known him for many years. And he's uh, a visible man, and he did a lot of good things for the Korean community. P Patricia has a solid track record in literature. I will read uh, her short bio. She was born and raised in Queens and graduated from the Bronx High School of Science. She earned her the BA degree in English from the Sorsmoor College and the MPA in fiction from Boston University. A former Fulbright scholar and the emerging writer fellow at the Center for Fiction, she has published essays in New York Times, Slice, and The Guardian. Slice is very interesting word. I break up when the slice means ball go right this. <laughs> it's a, um, I don't know what is a magazine. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a literary magazine. And uh, she has taught the writing at the Boston University, Queens College, and the Iwa Women's University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, she lives in Brooklyn now, and uh, my daughter lives in Brooklyn too. <laughs> I don't know if they married each other. <laughs> <or not. laughs> 
Um, these two, the books, the the mothers are here. The are the the title. These two books, Alice again and uh, Rejane, Rejane, um, I reimagine the stories. Alice again is born uh, is from the Alice in the Wonderland and the region from the 19th century world famous classic Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. And two authors reinvented the classic with a modern character, modern setting, and the modern touches. Um, tonight's book talk um, the will be follow um, will be going on as follows. Each writer will tell you what inspired them to write their stories, and then how they ch chose the title. And then the um, the second part will be they will tell you outline of the story, the character description, setting, and the some other important aspect of the story. And then the, I will give them some questions. And also, there is a crossfire that each uh, author will ask a question to the other <laughs> author. Okay, but <laughs> I don't think uh, they will uh, argue, but it's, uh, they will give them <laughs> questions. And the uh, stage uh, looks like a little bit uh, vice presidential <laughs> debate. But it's, this is a very friendly and the uh, talk, it's book talk. Always uh, um, the book discussion is very interesting for me and uh, for them too. After the, um, the discussion, the <laughs> they will sign the books and uh, some food and drinks will be uh, ready. So you will not live here with an empty stomach, okay? <laughs> you will at least have uh, something to eat. <laughs> In Korean custom, uh, there are some the non-Koreans here, but it's always senior first, and then junior follow. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I will give a chance to the Adrian, and uh, so what inspires to write uh, your book, and then tell the title. Tell me, you, tell us your story. Um, first, I'm happy to say that it is. I am much older than Patricia, and I'm glad to go first. But if we go Western style, which is fair and alphabetical, I still go first. So I go first. <laughs> 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 um, Alice Again is about a middle-aged woman who takes magic Korean seeds that she gets from a shaman and finds herself not sleeping, but going to a magical land where everything is different, but not quite different. And by the way, she's 26. And yes, it's my autobiography. You didn't believe that, did you? <laughs> 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 um, it is something that happened to me, not, no magic seed, sadly, and I didn't turn 26. But my life changed radically one day. And it occurred to me that it was like I entered another place because nothing was the same, and yet everything was the same. So for me, Wonderland is not a place to visit, but a place to stay. Um, at the time that I wrote it, was my, it's my third book, and at the time that I wrote it, I was actually working on something else. And I, I went to dinner with my old friends. And when I say old friends, I mean that in both ways. Everyone was approaching their 60s, and the conversation all was stemming from having work done. Now, when I do book talks outside of New York and I say the conversation was about having work done, they think I mean DIY for a house. In New York, when ladies meet and say they're having work done, it's limited to this area, <laughs> <laughs> although it may cost the same as redoing your house. And I was fascinated by women who had so much going for them, and all they wanted to do was look like they had no um, uh, backstory. And that's the most interesting part of people is their story. At, this, uh, at the same time, I was straddling two worlds, and my world is very Korean. Um, uh, it started by accident. I like random starts. Um, I was a teacher in Little Neck, New York, 
and the population of the school changed. And populations change for every New York City school teacher. My husband is a, was a dean of a school, and he had a particular ethnic group that, that he saw all the time. He never felt what I felt. And I said, don't you, don't you feel like you know, you're, you're starting to become like your kids and their families? And he said, never. And neither did any other teacher. But I was very happy to be an older teacher because I will tell you this from my experience that the way Korean children are being raised now was exactly the way Brooklyn children were raised in the 1950s. There's a pecking order that can never be disturbed. I lived in an extended family. My grandmother was in charge of everything, and my father was her henchman. I get Korean family life. The first time I saw a drama and saw the mother-in-law, sadly, I got that too. <laughs> <laughs> she was so real. <laughs> So because of that, it led me to abandon the third book I was writing in a series, which was always about Korean Americans and non-Korean Americans, and start to think about what would happen. At the same time, I was teaching classics to a group of wonderful kids called the Sunday Readers. Um, it started with Julius Caesar. It ended with um, Brave New World. So the classics were meaningful to me. And I thought of that what happens to Alice does happen in children's literature and in fantasies. Not a big fan of science fiction. I think that's boy stuff. No offense to you two. <laughs> but I do love fantasies. And so that's what guided me. So I'm just going to do one little reading, the beginning, so you can meet Alice at 62. And then, because I'm such a Korean drama fan, I have to do a love scene. That's just for me. If, you're, if you don't stay for it, that's okay. I'll read it anyway. If Wishes Were Horses. There's something better out there. Travel rapid Eastern Metro. I reread the bus company's ad on the back of the menu twice to keep my mind off the bread basket. It didn't help. I plucked out a salt-crusted breadstick and slathered it in butter. Why should I count carbs on my birthday? On four evenings each year, we, the members of Colucci Restaurante Birthday Dinner Club, would meet to celebrate. That sultry summer Friday of 2009 was my night. Colucci's drew a crowd whatever the season, not for its cuisine or ambience, but for its ample parking lot, a valuable asset in car-loving Queens, New York. Laura, Eileen, and I were seated at our usual table beneath the city ceiling fan when Peg, silvery wisp of hair clinging to her sweat on her forehead, rushed in late. She was an adjunct professor at Adelphi University, and at 64, two years older than us, she was also the only one with a full-time job. Have you ordered your salads yet, or am I the only thing at this table that's wilted, she quipped. Over the years, Peg's sense of humor had soothed my soul. If she hadn't had a teaching career while I was home raising twin boys, I'm sure we would have been best friends. Sit down and cool off. I was just talking about that thief, Dr. Gold. Laura pointed to the lone, empty chair for our friend. Which Dr. Gold are you calling a thief, Law? Peg lifted the bread baskets by its handle. The one in Great Neck across from the Thai restaurant or the one near TJ Maxx? The TJ Maxx's gold is my dentist. I'm talking about my dermatologist. Laura tucked a lock of faux auburn hair behind her ear and pointed to her cheek. He wanted to charge me $1,200 for Cosmolin injections, even though he couldn't guarantee they would fade my age spots. We stopped eating our salads to inspect Laura's spots. Divorced and alone, she obsessed over every new sign of aging. There wasn't a cream or laser treatment she hadn't tried, and we knew she would have sold her soul for the price of a facelift. Yet for as long as I had known her, she had put off surgery to correct her lazy eye. I'm not so vain that I'd go under the knife of my strabismus, she'd tell me, even though I never asked. I had heard a strabismus defense regularly, and it always left me wondering why she'd choose something to make her look better rather than see better. Laura and I had been friends since she moved next door when our children were toddlers. Too often I found her snarky and sometimes downright mean, yet I carpooled and hit local tag sales with her. Although Ke Peg may have been a better choice as confidant, I, like Carlucci's customers, had chosen convenience over sustenance. The four of us sat behind our salads with thick ranch dressing and mini plastic cups on the side. Salad dressing served this way is supposed to aid portion control but as we talked, we drowned our greens in the cups. 
Then we all asked for seconds on the dressing. I had two doctors with the same last name, Peg began. That's a mistake I won't make again. One was Dr. Carl Lee, gynecologist. The other was Dr. George Lee, my foot doctor. Once I thought about calling the gyno about my hormone replacement therapy. I wanted to check out my side effects, so I s phoned him from the car to make sure he was in. Peg stopped to snatch a garlic knot. You know I can't drive with my readers, and I can't read without them, so I couldn't make out which number was C. Lee and which was G. Lee. Anyway, I got the receptionist. She says, Dr. Lee's office. I tell her I'm Peg Toll and his patient, and that the menopause meds he put me on really made me sick. My belly was popping out, my breasts were hot, and I was very wet down there. I'm waiting for an answer so long, I thought the phone went dead. Then she said, you've reached Dr. Lee, the podiatrist. Now, I'd like to tell you I made that up, but that story happened to me. <laughs> what did you say, I asked? Oh, I said, oh, well, never mind. This is Meg Bolin hanging up now. Quick thinking. I wished I could tell a story like Peg. Hmm. Laura snorted as she doused a cucumber with dressing. I doubt your name change did anything at all. We could always count on Laura to put Peg down, although I was never sure why. Eileen stopped checking her cell messages to laugh out loud at Peg's punchline. I have to tell my daughter-in-law that story. Then she flipped the cell phone closed to rifle through the bread baskets. Aren't there any more onion rolls? I'm still starving. All I had to eat today was Calder's burnt egos this morning. Calder was Eileen's granddaughter and her preferred topic of conversation. Eileen triumphantly lifted the last roll. Calder was crying and kicking while I tried to figure out how the exhaust fan under the micro works. I was afraid the toaster would trigger my son's house alarm again. The last time that happened, we had half, had half of Larchmont Fire Department show up. You ate burnt egos? I wondered what I would have liked babysitting my grandchildren every day. By the time I hit the right button, the stupid thing was charred. I couldn't feed it to a two-year-old, but I couldn't just throw it out. How many dinners had we eaten together? I tallied up the years. We originally met as young mothers at the Glen Oaks Playground. As our children grew up and moved on, we morphed into a birthday dinner club. I had planned to defect from the group in 2001 after Peg convinced me to apply to graduate school for creative writing. But before I could, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center exploded into rubble, killing 2,753 souls, including police officer Luke Pleasance, my firstborn. I added my future to everything else that died that day. And yet another birthday passed as if I was still alive inside. I took comfort from my glass of rosé. If I can't be happy, I could at least be numb. Laura wrapped on her new wine glass for attention, then placed an emerald silk tote with an elaborate top knot next to my cake. This is from that little herb shop on Northern. The owner's a Korean guy named Mr. Kim. Everybody swears by his medicinal seeds. I loosened the tie to remove a small sachet that looked like the little plastic packets found in new coat pockets, the one that absorbs the damp so we won't know they come from overseas sweatshops. Mr. Kim is famous for his sleep aids, Laura went on. You should start tonight. I tore off a corner and sniffed. The seeds smelled organic, not exactly pungent, but earthy like rain-soaked soil. I sprinkled a few into my palm. They were ruby red and as tiny as strawberry seeds. Are they eaten or steeped like tea? Eileen put on her readers to scrutinize the business card among the sachets. Shouldn't you ask your doctor if it's okay to take oriental medicine? At our age, we've got to be careful with drug interactions, Peg agreed. I'll wait to return with three cups of coffee and Laura's tea. I wondered what young women talk about. I thought of Luke's girlfriend, Emma, a California transplant with a ready smile and a devotion to jogging. We should have tried to get to know each other. I suppose we thought we had a lifetime to do that. Emma moved back to Carmel a few years ago. I hope she found another good man. Alice, you're supposed to swallow them. Take them tonight so you'll finally get a good night's sleep. Laura urges she jammed Mr. Kim's card into my purse. Keep that for refills. What the heck? I had already tried every cure from alcohol to Ambien for my chronic insomnia. Why not try seeds? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Laura began singing. I clapped along. Even the wait staff joined in. Maybe the back end of this year will be better. Make a wish. What are you going to wish for? I knew I'd be the turd in the punch bowl if I said my real wish aloud. I'll just say a little prayer, okay? I closed my eyes. 
please, Lord, turn back time to September 10th, 2001. I want to be Alice Pleasance, mother of twin sons with their whole lives ahead of them, not the Pieter I've become. I blew. The flames flickered, then righted themselves. Very funny. Who bought the trick candles? They're regular candles. Try again, Alice. And say your wish out loud. You're among friends. Here's my wish. I wish... I just wish, come on, Alice. I swear, Alice, there aren't trick candles. The waiter placed a milk pitcher and sugar bowl in front of me. His cologne was musky like the scent that was popular years ago. I wish that one more time in my life a young, dark-eyed man in tight jeans would notice me. Then in one breath, I snuffed the candles out. Yeah, next, uh, the Patricia. <coughs> it's a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, and thank you to the Career Society for hosting. Um, I wrote my first novel uh, called Re Jane, and it's a coming-of-age story of a half-Korean, half-white orphan girl from Queens, um, and it's also a modern-day retelling of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre to boot. And I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many of you have read Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre? Okay, no, that's <laughs> wonderful. I, and that's not to shame those of you who haven't, but um, I, I was just curious. And, and I'd like to think, though, although that my novel pays homage to, to Jane Eyre, that it's still a standalone novel and you know, hopefully can be appreciated without um, having that, that kind of previous knowledge of the original kind of classic text. Um, so I was born in a place called Flushing, Queens. And, and very coincidentally, because this is a work of fiction, my protagonist, Jane Rhee, is also from Flushing. And, and my version of America growing up was all Korea all the time. Um, I lived in a Korean community there, um, so it was just uh, a very, I think it's a very dynamic kind of take on the American experience. Um, also, when I was growing up, this idea of Queen's pride felt like an oxymoron. Um, more often than not, it, it felt like Queen's reluctance. Um, I wonder if you agree, Adrian. Um, having <laughs> <laughs> but just growing up, you know, I, I felt as an outer borough that you're constantly living in both the literal and metaphorical shadows of Manhattan. You know, um, all our roads led to the city. And I'm also just curious, too, is anyone here from Queens? Anyone? Uh. All right, so you guys feel my pain. <laughs> you feel Jane's pain as well. Um, and, you know, Queens doesn't have much in the way of media representation. I mean, what do we have? We have all in the family, the king of Queens, the nanny, coming to America, these are hardly reflections of high culture. Um, and, and even the Jeffersons, I mean, they lived next door to Archie Bunker, but they were very quick to move on up to the east side, well, to, to these parts over here. And I just felt that as a native Queens, that there's just so much of a rich history in, in our borough. You have all these different ethnic enclaves living, s living um, side by side, and I don't think there's much in the way of a, of a Queens novel, so... I, um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to change that. So I'm going to read a very short passage where Jane is on the seven train uh, leaving Queens, and, and these are some of her thoughts. I boarded the seven train leaving Main Street flushing. There was an unmistakable rattle whenever you stepped aboard the seven, as if the train cars were hinged together by a single loose pin. But I wasn't heading for the city. I was on my way to Brooklyn. There was a geographical irony of leaving Queens for Brooklyn, two outer boroughs that abutted each other. The fastest route was to make a right angle through Manhattan, crossing both bridge and tunnel. I should, I should mention that um, the novel is set from 2000 to 2003, so just on the cusp of, of all of this gentrification and kind of hipsterification of the outer boroughs. Um, it's not that we all had beef, per se. We acknowledged our kindred scrappiness to the city. We were, after all, bridge and tunnel. All our roads led to Manhattan. It was the borough that blazed in its own violet light and threw scraps of shadows on the rest of us. I'd driven through Brooklyn only a handful of times in my life. My uncle sang would make us roll up the windows and double check that our car doors were locked. He'd run off the entire borough after a fruit and vegetable store he owned on Smith Street went up in flames during a blackout. According to my Aunt Hannah, Sang had stumbled ha home that night with burnt clothes, a black eye, and a busted rib. Since then, 
his mind conflated the three Bs, Brooklyn, black people, and the blackout. Add to that one more B, a baby, a bundle of joy, me. I was a burden, the daughter of his dead sister who'd gotten knocked up by a GI stationed in Seoul, and a honyol, or a mixed blood bastard, to boot. My mother had died of carbon monoxide poisoning from the fumes of cold, cheap coal briquettes used for cooking and heating, an all too common occurrence in Korea back then. Rightfully, I should have died too, had not Providence, or maybe it was the police, saved me from the wreckage. After her death, the responsibility of dealing with me defaulted to my grandfather. The way I pictured it, he stepped outside one morning, and there I was, swaddled on his doorstep. There was no question I would have been stigmatized if I'd stayed in the motherland. My dubious lineage would have undoubtedly come to light. But here's another geographical irony for you. I traveled nearly 7,000 miles across the globe to escape societal censure, only to end up in the second largest Korean community in the Western world. We were stuttering our way out of Queens. The seven train was like that, teretic. The lights blinked on and off. The rickety train cars jerked from side to side as much as front and back. I stared at the other slump passengers. The faces repeated in a pattern. Korean, Hispanic, Chinese, Chinese again, Indian. You could always tell by their worn expressions that they were going from home to work. You could always tell by their worn shoes, all sharing the same thick rubber soles designed to absorb the work of the day. The train emerged above ground, the windows opening to the sprawl of flushing. First, you saw a beautiful clock tower sitting on top of a concrete storage warehouse with loud capital letters, U-Haul. Then the Van Wick snaking its way through heaps of sand and ash, through auto body shops and junkyard lots. Wood and steel beams stacked and abandoned for as long as I could remember. There were rows of frayed, tarped storefronts with Korean lettering. Then the view of Shea, a stadium, the shade of working class blue with dimly lit neon figures at bat. On game nights, you could barely make out the half-hearted roars of the half-empty crowds, a smattering of loyal fans in blue and orange nylon jackets. Ahead, the silvered peaks of the midtown skyline glinted in that violet light. This was our queen's wasteland. Then the lights in the train car flickered off. Thank you. Um. If you read too much, they will not read a book. Okay. <laughs> so let them make a uh, read a book. Um, so it's uh, um, you read less mm. now. And then the, uh, let's talk about uh, the titles. Uh, these two titles are, in a way, in a sense, it's just similar. The re chain means again, and the Alice again means uh, again. Okay. Mm. And I want to ask you to each where the title came from. We can imagine, but it's uh, um, the similarities and differences of the Jane Eyre. And then you are, you are the Alice in the Wonderland. And uh, let's talk about that. This time, oh. you first. <laughs> um, well, re Jane has three meanings. Um, one is re, you know, ab about, um, uh, you know, regarding the way that it would be thrown in a subject heading of an email. Um, another meaning of re is, again, like a retelling, a readaptation of Jane Eyre and kind of ticket, tipping its hat to um, Charlotte Bronte's classic text. But um, thirdly, re is Jane's last name, R-E. And the original last name in Korean is E, as you all know, just like the letter. Um, and the most common kind of Western perversion, or maybe I should say bastardization, of E is Lee, L-E-E, -E, or R-H-E-E. -E. So re, R-E, is kind of... It's very rare. It's kind of like a bastard of the bastardizations. Okay, and uh, and then the the Adrian. When um, my assistant told me that 
they were going to pair me with an author whose book is Reed Jane. So I just heard Reed Jane. And um, I want to tell you, the, my working title for Alice again was Reboot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we are clearly on the so same wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> so um, because I always thought of it as a rebooting. And, I, and with the Alice in Wonderland in the back of my head and, and her, her um, not be, she does not become a different person. Um, the, the focus of Lewis Carroll was more about never, uh, Wonderland or Neverland, um, Wonderland than, than the character. But for me, it was you can't ch go through so much change without being changed. Okay. And then the, uh, my next question um, is that uh, what's the similarities and differences between the Jane about 180 years ago and the modern Jane in your book? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what really struck me about Jane Eyre when I first read it is that she's a, a protagonist who self-describes as poor, obscure, plain, and little. And she was just such a departure from these beautiful Disney heroines that I was weaned on. I first read it when I was 12. And rightfully, someone who is plain and poor should not have any kind of airtime in the space of a novel. And yet this, this character of Jane was so self-assured, she was so independent, and she was the ultimate underdog, yet she managed to succeed and, and find her way. So I, I wanted to be true to that spirit of, of the original Jane Eyre in casting my Jane as a, as a mixed-race Korean from Queens. Um, one of the challenges, though, of taking like a 19th century novel is that there are just certain conventions that don't fly in modern-day times. I mean, it's not cool to have a marriage proposal from your cousin. I mean, that kind of thing, you know, it's very <laughs> difficult uh, for a modern-day reader to just go along with it. Um, and, you know, that, that was very commonplace in, in Victorian novels. Also, the conventions for Victorian heroines was uh, that they did, or just maybe the roles of women in that society was, you know, just a lot more passive. And a lot of times you'll have Victorian heroines waiting around for things to happen. Oh my gosh, is he going to propose? Oh, this letter, is it going to come? No, it doesn't. I just sit and wait and, you know, cried myself to sleep. Jane Eyre is, is a departure from her other, from the conventional Victorian heroine because she does take action. You know, she leaves a bad situation. She tries to find work, yet she still is a product of her times. So I found that in very early drafts of Jane, of, of my novel and of my version of Jane, she was less active and more reactionary. So I had to find that you kind of have to divorce yourself from certain frameworks and, and think about all the options afforded to a modern day heroine that were just not uh, choices available to women in the 19th century. Okay, and same question to you. Um, well, first of all, um, if you've read Alice in Wonderland, how many of you've read Alice in Wonderland? How many of you saw the Disney cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> Cartoons better. Um, <laughs> Alice is a little girl, but Alice, Carol's Alice, is a true mini Victorian girl. She's quiet, she's docile, and well schooled. She wears very tight clothes, and she's content in that framework. She's. It opens with her being bored, but never saying, "I want to leave this area. I want to go run and play." She only falls into the hole. She doesn't find the hole. My Alice in Queens, by the way, I was raised in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> How funny we did a switcheroo. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is true to her time. She is middle-aged. She is suburban. She identifies with being a um, wife and mother. And really, n neither Carol's Alice or my Alice would ever be anything that they were, than they were supposed to be except that they have something else. They have spunk. They have grit. They don't call upon it until they feel they have to. When Alice falls, Carol's Alice falls into the hole, she doesn't try to get out. She's amazed at what happens. And what Carol did beautifully was that he had her grow and shrink very much like the things that happen in adolescence. She plays with it. She's fine with it. My Alice has to actually change. She's not expecting to grow with old age. She's expecting to die after old age. She's not looking for anything except maybe some peace. 
But yet, when she wakes up 26 years old in a parallel universe, very much like, but not exactly like her New York, she doesn't say, this is crazy and I'm leaving. She goes with it. She starts to play with it. Yeah, I want to give this question to the Patricia. Um, when I finished uh, reading the book, I found a lot of the Korean the, 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 the words. Nunchi, it's uh, nunchi is I sense. But it's I found uh, nunchi means more than just the I sense, maybe mind I sense. Okay? <laughs> it's com more than common sense. And also the, the Korean word tap tap is repeated in many parts of the story. And uh, my question is about the tap tap um, Get out of the tap tap means freedom. And then the Jane felt tap tap at her uncle's uh, the grocery store. And then she, the, what is it, ran away or left, went to the Brooklyn. And then she met the, the Ed Farley. And then they liked each other. But it's uh, when time passes, she felt tap tap And then she left to Korea. And then she met the, the Korean boyfriend. And uh, they, they loved each other uh, for a certain period of time. And then she felt again tap tap And then she left the, um, the Korean boyfriend. And then came back here and rejoined with uh, Ed. And then they had a very happy time for a certain period of time. And then she felt uh, again tap tap her. And then she left uh, the Ed world. So it's uh, my interpretation of a tap tap her and uh, um, what is looking for freedom. Is it correct? That's what you meant? I, I think they do go hand in hand. I mean, I think for Jane, the concept of, of nunchi and tap tap go hand in hand because <laughs> it's very, to always observe nunchi yeah. is very, <laughs> yeah. makes you tap tap like <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and for Jane, she grew up in a, even though she grew up in America, ironically, her version of America was very Korean, but a kind of Korea that was preserved in time from the 1960s and 70s, you know, when her uncle and aunt came over from, from Korea. So she always feels like she has to watch it. And I, I imagine most of you are, are familiar with nunchi, but for those who aren't, um, the only way I can describe it is this ability to walk into a room, you know, read the situation and anticipate how you're expected to behave, anticipate how everyone else should behave. And uh, there's a, a wonderful character in the, in the book, uh, a friend of Jane's who's like a total sci-fi geek, uh, went to MIT, and she describes nunchi as, as like a Tolkien eye of Sauron, like an all-knowing <laughs> stink eye that just mm. monitors your every social misstep. Mm. And it's, it's very tap tap <laughs> <laughs> and, and in case, for those of you who, who may not be familiar with tap tap I mean, I think this motion kind of <laughs> catches <laughs> some of that. But it, yeah. it is a, a kind of a psychological, emotional, and at times a physical kind of discomfort or maybe a feeling of being constricted. And, and I, I'd hate for Jane to seem cavalier in that she goes from one situation, then leaves, and then leaves. But I, I think in terms of trying to find who she is, she was leaving a very sheltered home life, and the world that she knew was so limited. And as soon as she learns more information, it's just such a, so, there are so many possibilities out there. And she knows, she keeps thinking in every situation, I could just go with the flow, you know, conform to society, but she feels this kind of longing, and as you put it, maybe a kind of a freedom or a desire for freedom. Yeah. So she, it takes her on a rather peripatetic journey from Queens to Brooklyn to Seoul and then back again. So, uh, and I think at the very end, she has this release and it feels almost like air, mm -hmm. like yeah. releasing from a high pressured situation. And she feels, everything feels lighter. She feels she can breathe. And, and I think that's, to me, that's synonymous with coming home and finding your home. And really the journey is for Jane to make a home for herself and find out where so that is. So do you believe uh, um, she is a modern Jane comparing to the Jane Eyre in the Jane, in the Jane Eyre? I, I think so. I mean, the, there's like a joke that Victorian heroines, um, they only have four options or four fates. Um, marriage, immigration, inheritance, and or death. So that, I mean, you're very limited. 
also, the Victorians must have felt very tapped of it because they only <laughs> had a handful of choices. So I think Jane, if you translate her into modern times, I'd like to think. So what is well, what is the um, the the correct meaning of the tap tap pain in English? Because some of them. Oh, I, I think I explained just a little before, but um, the way that I would translate well, is one 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 word. Oh, I don't know discomfort. Um, discomfort or or it be stifling or yeah, stif yeah. like a stifling feeling, some okay. kind of constricting feeling. Okay. Um, We'll discuss a little bit more, and then we'll invite uh, your questions and the comments. Um, lots of the, I don't know this. I um, the Korean, the American boys likes the Korean girls, and uh, I saw a lot of the marriage. And then to them, the Korean girls looks very attractive. I don't know your case the same or not. And then your story, mostly American women likes, they like each other, but it's a Korean, the man. Mm. If, the, if you write another the novel, you want to change the, <laughs> <laughs> the role or the, what is the, the characterization mm. or the liking each other? I will tell you a story that um, a Korean friend of mine read uh, Alice again and said to me, you know, I, I wish there was a Hoon Park in my life. And she goes, but truthfully, there are no Korean men <laughs> like Hoon Park. And I said, there are no men like Hoon Park. This is a novel. <laughs> you know, of course he's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to her. But it's not because he's Korean. Yeah, okay. And also, um, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, my neck of the woods. Mm. Um, growing up in New York, um, and from the 1950s to the present, um, I saw things that I saw ethnic groups all the time. Uh, later on, when my son was raised, he went to a school called the Garden School in Astoria, and no one was the same color, no one was the same culture. And when he went to college, he went to a college in Pennsylvania where everybody was blonde. And he said, Mom, did, are you sending me to a farm? <laughs> um, so I'm used to what should be multiculturalism. Usually it's just neighborhood stops and another neighborhood begins. But I was very used to that. Um, Alice is not. Alice to, to Alice, when she finds herself in a New York that's mostly inhabited by Korean Americans and Koreans, it is a wonderland for her because she has no knowledge of it. Now, would I do that same storyline with, um, I don't know, I, uh, those of you who don't know me, I, when I was um, serving as um, an as a, a, uh, educational ambassador to Korea, one of, the, one of the side trips that the government took me on was to the DMZ. Uh, I was there the first uh, morning after, actually I was there the morning after the first shooting in 25 years, so the first phone call I made was to my husband, said, don't tell my mom that I'm in, <laughs> because I knew she was gonna read there was a shooting there. Um, but I made a promise that day, and that was to bring back everything I could to the Korean American community so that other non-Koreans and non-Asians would see the Korea that I see. And so I know there's going to be Koreans in whatever books I write now. Okay. <laughs> um, now the, uh, we invite your questions and uh, comments. And uh, we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes. So you have uh, time. <laughs> Who's going to be first? I'm going to be first. Ask questions I for am. <laughs> <laughs> Crossfire. <laughs> you have your book with you. I <laughs> would love to see a scene, hear from you, a scene that you, your choice, just of the book, because oh. you read so beautifully. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, um, <laughs> this is. Mm, Am I putting you on the spot? Oh. Then I'll pick one. Oh, <laughs> no, I'll, you pick. One. I'll just um, let's see. Maybe I I didn't get a read from the very beginning of the book, so short, just short two reading. Okay. Two short paragraphs yeah. just to contextualize things. Um. Maybe this makes sense. Um, okay, home was a nor this northeastern knot of Queens in the town, if you could call it a town, of Flushing. Northern Boulevard was our main commercial thoroughfare and two family attached houses crowded its side streets. They say the neighborhood once contained a hearty swath of the American population. But when I landed here as an infant, Flushing was starting to give way to the Koreans. By the time I graduated from college in 2000, Northern looked like this. 
Taedong River Fish Market, <laughs> named after the East River of Pyongyang. Joseon Dynasty Auto Body, run by the father of a girl from my BC Calc class. Kumgang Mountain Dry Cleaning, owned by my uncle's accountant's cousin on his mother's side. This was my America, all Korean, all the time. Flushing. The irony was that none of its residents could pronounce the name of their adopted hometown. The Korean language lacked certain English consonants and clusters. The letter F was assimilated to an H or a P. The adults at church would go who as they formed the word, as if cooling it off their tongue. My uncle announced rendition, poo rushing. It could have been poetry. <laughs> and. Uh, um, we need your questions. Uh, let them answer, okay? I'll ask a question. Mm. Out of all the classics, why Jane Eyre and why Alice mm. in Wonderland? Would you like to go first? Oh. oh. Um, Alice in Wonderland is um, something very recognizable to women of my generation. Um, we were fed Cinderella and Snow White and Alice and all the women who we idolized were waiting. That prince was going to come. There was no doubt. Don't settle for less. It's so incorrect now. But I don't have any dismay for the women of my generation because they set the bar high. If you're going to hook up with somebody, she better be a princess, and he better be a prince, because life is long when you have to pick up someone's underwear off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so why Alice? Because I love fantasies. I love the beauty of them. I love the happy endings. Um, when I wrote this and I said, oh my goodness, it's starting to sound like science fiction, and I had to look up things like paradigms and alternate universes, and I said, this is so not me. This is very male. And then I realized when someone said to me, oh, you're writing a, uh, um, a romantic fantasy, and I said, yes, I am. I'm writing a romantic fantasy, and I feel much better now. <laughs> so that's why it was Alice in Wonderland. Um, I guess for me, uh, you know, I wanted to pay homage to my two formative cultural influences, my, my ethnic Korean background um, and the, the Victorian canonical books that, that basically shaped my literary consciousness and all set in the backdrop of my native queens. Um, it was funny because when I was growing up and I would misbehave, my mother would say in her, you know, in her limited English, like, you act like orphan. And I, I never knew what that meant because you either are, I, she, she was my mother, so <laughs> clearly I wasn't an orphan. Um, but she told me I was acting like one. And I think for her generation of Koreans, to act like an orphan meant that you behaved in a disgraceful way that brought shame to your family. And Jane Eyre, too, is a character who's constantly thrown these epithets. She's called wicked, mischievous, uh, friendless. And um, I, I came to realize that the Victorian um, construct of the orphan had a lot of these similarities with the Korean post-war one, that orphans somehow embodied these these um, kind of negative traits. So I think my mind drew that link, and, and that was how Rejane Jane was born. Yeah, any more questions? And, uh, yes. What inspired you to become a writer? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want that? Oh, you spoke. OK. We'll be fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've always wanted to be a writer. If I wasn't going to be a writer, I was going to be a talker. But since there were no jobs for talkers, uh, except teaching, which was lucrative and had great medical, um, which is what I did first. But I always wrote. And I think if you feel the inspiration to be a writer, it shouldn't just be a fairy tale for you. you writers write. And that was the best advice I got. Writers write. They write every day. Do you get writer's block? Absolutely. Now, I'd like to tell you that when it does happen to me, you know, I go out, I take a walk, I get inspired from nature. Mostly I eat a lot sitting in the same seat. I eat a lot of candy, a lot of chocolate. Then I weigh myself and feel really terrible, and then I have something to write about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm partial to, like, muffins and Diet Coke. That's what I eat <laughs> when I'm sitting in my spot. But, uh, no, I also wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. Um, I went to Catholic school, and... For a while, I wanted to be a writer slash nun 
So they'd mm-hmm. make you draw pictures of what you want to be when you grow up. So I'd have like a split screen. There was a nun on one side and a writer on the other. And then I realized that maybe <laughs> the two don't quite, I don't know. I, I, I can, you know, maybe I should be proven wrong. But mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I've always wanted to write. Um, but I completely agree with Adrian, And I, I would echo that, that you kind of have to put in your time or it's like that, the Gladwellian 10,000 hour rule yeah. where I, I was writing my whole life and I thought, oh, you bang out a novel in a year and then you know, 12 <laughs> years go by. Um, so you just kind of have to keep honing that craft, sitting in that spot, sitting that spot. writing <laughs> and then rewriting, throwing it all away. <laughs> yeah, and also any comments or the, the questions? Yes, uh, way in the back. Someone just put up his hand, but I can't see. No. If you... I've got a question. Okay. Yes. At every book talk, this has been asked. Oh. When you write, where is it that you write? Like, is there a special yeah. place, or do you write anywhere, or is there a place you go to write when you're working on a book? Um, I love that question, <laughs> because um, the magic place that, that Alice goes to, she nicknames Red Sky. It's not magic that it became Red Sky. I, um, I have a little house in, in what was Floral Park, Queens, now Glen Oaks, Queen. They changed the name at, at night when we weren't aware of it. Um, and the only, the only saving grace of this little house is that it has a round room, which I love. So I suggest if you decide to write, get a laptop, not a computer that you can't move with. Find your space with a laptop or a netbook. Um, but every, m- and, I, I, and I, like Alice, I have insomnia. Um, actually, all my characters always have, my main characters always have insomnia. I'm hoping to give it to them, but they still share it with me. <laughs> so I wake up somewhere around 4 and 5 in the morning, every morning. And so it was not an accident that I sat in my little round room facing three windows, and then the sky becomes red every morning, except on a day like today when it's raining. But the red sky would come up. And so here I am bathed in this red, beautiful sunrise every morning. And so where Alice goes turned out to be red sky. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could write from home. I try. Uh-huh. I would probably save a lot of money if I <laughs> because I, I, I go to cafes or I, I go anywhere where, again, you have access to food and drink. <laughs> so libraries, again, would probably be a, more, would be a better option, but then you can't smuggle <laughs> <in> your food. <laughs> I think I think eating or something may, maybe it's a form of procrastination with your writing. You're like this sentence sucks. So I'm just gonna <laughs> eat some candy or something. I don't know. Um, so actually, though, I do write probably my nonfiction from home fairly decently. Um, and for fiction, I used to have access when I was living in Boston to to a great library at BU. Um, and you can kind of be in your cubby and no one bothers you. Um, but now I just write from different cafes and. And again, when I'm writing shorter nonfiction, then, then I sometimes write from home. Um, in the beginning, the, I said that you are mothers, okay? And the, your <laughs> daughter's name is a Jane, and uh, your daughter's name is Alice. If you write another book, do you want to put the, the boy's name on title? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, my plans for my second book, which I'm, I'm, I'm working on. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's, uh, there's a male protagonist, so... We'll see what his adventures are. <laughs> he's in the he's in this book, so he gets his own book oh. in the second book, the third book. Yeah. book so, so it uh, will be very interesting when the is supposed to be come out. <laughs> Ask me in like ten years. <laughs> <laughs> because it takes time. Okay. It does, yeah. And uh, the I said the uh, um, the mother there what is uh, can produce the baby in nine months. But it's a produce a book. It takes a lot more than nine months, <laughs> years, and some writers uh, um, takes uh, many years for the research, and then they visit uh, at the place they want to describe, and then um, it takes a lot of time. In your case, uh, your next baby will be girl too, or there will be boy. Mm. Actually, no. I'm working on a screenplay. And again, it, the, the protagonist is a, is a female. 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 So always female. girl, okay. I think so. I, I'm comfortable, you know, and I'm a girly girl. That means if my main character is not wearing heels and shopping at TJ Maxx, I really have no <laughs> where to put her and what to do with her. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm reading quite a lot of uh, what is novels recently because I belong to two English book clubs, but it's uh, some books. 
it's not boy or not the girl, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Oh. Uh, no sex or whatever. And uh, we have about a little bit, five minutes, five more minutes, and uh, we are inviting more questions because uh, this is the, um, the chance you can ask questions to the authors directly. Yeah. Well, you want a question oh, for her? Oh, I was actually going to, um, <laughs> we can go first. Um, okay. Yeah, and then I'll ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. so I was wondering if, either of your books, you had a clear picture of the ending of the book and then kind of wrote it through? Or did the ending kind of transform as you were writing it? And lastly, how, how did you know the book was complete? When was that moment for you? Um, there's a great expression in Korean dramas. I wouldn't have gone this far if I thought I was going to end early. And, and uh, I always knew how it would end for Alice and Hoon Park. Um, did you asked if, well, had I know it was done? I can pick up a book. Uh, there is a famous author who also did this, by the way. I don't want to say his name. But um, I can pick up the book now and start editing. This I uh, that's my little problem. Maybe because I taught English, I'll edit anything. You know, so I, I could edit it again. <laughs> Yeah, they, there's like so an old. Never, so it's never done. It's never yeah. done. <laughs> it's never done. If I come back in ten years, I could tweak it a little more. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the joke in publishing is that like the manuscript has to be wrestled out of the hands <laughs> of the, <laughs> the writer, writer. <laughs> because you've got a publishing schedule. Right. So uh, I, I think that that makes sense. Um, for me, um, the ending, I, I knew. I knew how Jane was going to end up, but there were. I was for years peddling the wrong ending. I knew that I needed to tie two storylines together and bring two families together, but I brought the wrong members of the family together, so it felt like a false mm. tact on ending. Mm. Um, it's funny because when I was in grad school, I, I studied with this writer who, his advice was, you should know about 60% of how the story ends. Too little and you're just kind of floating in the, you know, in the mm. dark or shooting mm. in the dark, and, and too much and you're like in a straight jacket. So, or maybe another kind of form of yeah, thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think if you don't have a sense of where it's going to end, um, what's the famous line? In the beginning, there is the end. And I can't remember which Russian writer said yeah. that. But um, if you don't know, then you're just, this is what your novel becomes. And it's just yeah. floating in yeah. space. Um, so I think you need to know. But it was, it's only through writing that you know, ex I found that you know exactly how it's going to end. Because your characters will then say, no, I don't want to go where you're telling me to go. This is where I'm going to go. And then you have to mm -hmm. follow their path and then recreate uh, new scenes accordingly. So what is your question to her? Oh, I was going to ask you, I'm, I'm so curious about your, your relationship with Korean culture, and I'm wondering if you could tell us what drew you in, what you find most captivating about the culture, and I know that's a very general question, but also what were some of the challenges for you as a, as a Westerner trying to um, uh, become part of Korean society, and whether that's Korean-Korean or Korean-American, yeah. whether you distinguish it or not, I, I'm just curious to know. Um, when I was teaching, and 90% uh, of my, my students became, they it morphed into uh, Koreans and I, Korean Americans. And I, I can't even tell you the feeling that I was home. It was very odd. And, but I was raised in a way that mirrored the Korean American experience. And so that when my kids spoke, I got it. You know what I didn't get? Um, they would talk about church. Um, and, and I came from New York where, you know, there's just, you know, throw up cars in the air and you're going to hit 17 different <laughs> religions when you, when you come down. And so I didn't realize until um, I started to become uh, a churchgoer myself how important it was to the Korean community because I did not, my, I grew up with socialists. They're very nice people, but they have no faith. <laughs> um, so, um, so I found that when I met their mothers, they were very much like the mothers and aunts I had. When I met their dads, their dads were very much like my own father and my grandfather. And the pecking order, I really understood. Um, did I get everything right? No. Um, when I was in Korea and I would come back, um, I remember someone saying, did, what, did, what uh, didn't you like in Korea? And I said, well, really, I didn't, I didn't dislike anything in Korea. And they said, well, you didn't like the food, did you? Now, keep in mind, that was 2003. And I said, no, I like the food. However, 
I didn't think that Korean food would put Korea in the essence and the mindset of America. I really thought it was the dramas, mostly because I was addicted. I thought everybody else would be too. Um, so I, I said, oh no, it's going to be the dramas that are going to get Westerners so involved with Korean culture. Um, looking now at how America has embraced Korean food, it's a thrill for me because um, if you go to Fairway, they charge like $5 for a jar of kimchi. It, that's outrageous. But if you go to H Mart, very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so what drew me, I guess it was something that mirrored my own childhood. And also, I think it was a welcoming community. And um, I like to tell people, um, my friends are Korean. I, I now have finally made that exit out of, of having Western friends, not just accidentally and how it works in life. But one time I was with a group of my friends, and I see them as my friends. And we walk by a glass door. And I remember looking at myself, and I said, oh, I'm not Korean. <laughs> <laughs> and I will the, uh, we'll invite uh, one more question, and then the, uh, it's about to end uh, today's book discussion. Yes. How is your career? Took him. But... When I'm in H Mart with my husband, <laughs> as a little joke, I go, Yo <laughs> <laughs> And every Ajima in H Mart goes, <laughs> <laughs> And here comes my blonde Irishman bowing down after buying a six pack of height. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, well, I, I speak imperfect Korean perfectly. <laughs> um, that's the extent of my, my Korean. So, it, you know, I'll have long conversations with other Koreans in Korean about how bad my Korean is. <laughs> and then they, they insult my Korean. I, I say, that, yes, thank you for <laughs> insulting my, or for, for these compliments, or whatever, for your comments. And so I understand everything. And yeah, but I, I'm, I speak like a kyopo, like a Korean American. Yeah, okay. Um. Thank you for your time, and uh, I want to spread the word. We have uh, two um, um, beautiful the baby girls, <laughs> and uh, um, the anybody can what is look at the how beautiful the babies are, and then take care of the baby. <laughs> um, writing a book is um, it's very difficult. Um, it as I told you, it takes years and the years of research and uh, to prepare. And also, um, the change, revision, revise, revise, and revise. But still, when it's done, not completely satisfied. Okay. <laughs> Never satisfied. <laughs> yeah. And then I told you it takes uh, two mothers took uh, a lot more than the nine months to produce the beautiful babies. But it's, I would say, selling books are even harder. <laughs> I, I had a good experience. Okay? I tried uh, very hard to sell my first uh, baby, first uh, number, and then <laughs> some people are teasing me, and why you do that, okay? But it's, uh, I enjoy that. I don't have uh, many books <coughs> left. Um, I want to spread the word, um, these two books, and uh, to help these two great uh, authors, whatever you can do. And I truly hope the success of uh, you two people. And I thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you.